All right, welcome back, everybody. We'll get started. <clears throat> so uh, today's the sort of second day of manipulation with clutter, uh, aka bin picking. There's a couple different um, terms I've used for it. Let me just make sure uh, to put the roadmap up again, just so we remember why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, so we started with basically a single known object assuming we knew the pose. We advanced to a single known object with an unknown pose, and we spent some time thinking about geometric approaches for pose estimation, right? Uh, with point cloud registration, uh, iterative closest point, for instance. And what we've been graduating to now is trying to do many diverse, potentially unknown objects with unknown poses, but while that could encompass like the rest of manipulation, we're doing a relatively simple version of that and looking at a case where you can get a lot done without knowing a lot about what the objects are effectively, right? So this clutter clearing task is this sort of nice task that I showed you last time where you kind of pick up anything from one bin, put it in the other bin, and that turns out to be a great way to sort of feed the data pipeline when we, we wanna start generating lots of random instances, lots of random picks, and start doing more learning-based uh, manipulation. Okay, so the problem for today is you've got a camera, but a depth camera, so it's our, both RGB and depth available. Um, you're looking down into a box of stuff, and it's got Cheez-Its and Spam cans and mustard bottles and all the great things you find in the YCB data set, okay? Um, the question is, where should you grab, right? Um, and that's what we're gonna talk a lot about today is we're gonna talk a bit about grasp analysis, grasp selection, um, our basic strategy, how do you get it from point clouds, uh, and, and we'll go into some details. Okay, so, um, but let me just, since I ended a bit before I meant to last time, and I won't, I'm not gonna go into details, but I just wanna, um, you know, sort of make sure that the roadmap from last time was clear, right? We talked about a couple different ways for, um, you know, well, I tried to, to show you that we're doing more advanced simulation now, and we, we need to understand our simulator a little bit better. If you get yourself into weird situations, I hope you gave, I gave you a little bit of intuition about the complexity that lies underneath, but there's a few parameters like the time step or the stiffness of your contacts that can have a big effect on how accurately you're, you simulate or how fast you simulate. There's also a bunch of subtleties like the fact that um, we use extra collision geometries. For instance, to, if we represent a box, we actually um, we drop in a few extra spheres for our collision geometries, okay? Um, I've written this all up in the notes. I hope that, and you've been working on it on your, on your problem set. I've given some examples here. Um, but the key idea I was trying to get to there was that we're gonna start our optimization, or start our, our simulation in some initial conditions, right? We've got a bunch of random objects in a random poses. What is the defining feature of that initial condition? Well, everything's still, right? So that puts some pretty strong um, priors on, on where the objects could possibly be. If I've generated a bunch of random objects, there's only a subset of possible configurations that are viable initial conditions where everything is at rest, okay? You can write down with your free body diagrams the conditions for finding an equilibrium where the forces balance on all of the objects that would imply that you're at, everything is at rest. And that's the kind of thing you're gonna do on the, on the problem set. Um, one of the key ideas there is this friction cone, right? So we have, um, we have contact frames and we have a friction cone. I drew two different friction cones in this particular, particular picture and I hope I, if it's, you know, all the, the simple versions of the equations are, are in the notes for this example. Okay, so you can imagine writing a small optimization saying, okay, I'll take some random initial poses, they might have some penetration, they might be floating in space, and I'll solve an optimization problem which solves for the static equilibrium, okay? I like this very much. I think that should be the right way to sort of um, bring an initial guess that is not a viable initial condition into alignment with the viable initial conditions, right? That's a beautiful way to think about it. And no one does it. 
and it makes me very sad. I don't do it, and it makes me very, very sad, okay? And the reason is that um, the optimization problems, when things start in deep penetration, have all of the problems that we've talked about with the collision geometries and strange normals flipping signs and things like this. It's a very ugly, very bad optimization problem, okay? So you can get, you'll get local minima where objects are still stuck inside each other and it will snop, will fail to solve. So instead, what we do is we just start things clearly out of penetration by just staggering them vertically. We run our simulator, wait till everything settles. It's like, makes me really sad that we do that. But I mean, okay, the, so what's the positive spin on that? Um, the physics engines are solving optimization problems also, right? But um, are just highly optimized, okay? They're solving these things very, very fast, but they've optimized the case where things are not in deep penetration, okay? And um, staying out of penetration, everything is clean and good, and you can sort of, you can use your physics engine to sort of uh, you know, advance time and, about to, and get to pretty quickly to a, um, a steady state solution. Pulling yourself out of penetration is just the hard version of the problem. And I think for our optimization, for SNOPT, for instance, to compete with the simulator, you'd have to bring a loads of like all these clever optimizations that the simulation people have done. Even though they're solving sometimes the wrong problem, they're just forward simulating and waiting till it settles. And you could say, just go straight to the equilibrium. Um, the advantage that, that you get from just having all these super highly optimized codes, um, SNOPT isn't competing with yet. Um, I think we'll slowly bring more of them into, into SNOPT and, and eventually be able to do these kind of things. Um, okay, so, so the question was, why do we even want static equilibrium as an, um, I guess I'm thinking that we're walking up to the sink, you know, things probably aren't moving. They've, you know, the initial conditions in my mind of the world have settled at some times. And so, so there's a, there's a set of equilibrium, right? There's probably nothing floating in the air that's still falling. There's nothing sliding. It's already slid. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I think the reasonable initial conditions of like you know walking up to a sink and you start to pick are things that have already settled. And so the question is just how do you find the already settled configurations, the viable physical configurations as well as possible? Good, good question. Is that clear, right? Is that? The problem with this approach of course is that um, it works for clutter clearing, but like, I think I said it in the notes, right? If you were trying to populate like random kitchens, right? You probably don't just drop fridge, refrigerators and toasters and stuff from the sky and hope they land in reasonable places. When your scene has more context, more structure, then this approach doesn't work. And then I think that's where the optimization based approaches can somehow take some prior of, for instance, like toasters tend to be on the table and, and other things, some, some initial guess, and then lock it in with physics. Okay, so um, so that was a bunch of of, uh, you know, of talk about simulation and how we get here, but now we're here. We've got our our, our image, we've got our point cloud, and I want to talk today about um, you know how do we start deciding what to do in that point cloud? Where do we pick? Okay, this is the Springer Handbook of Robotics, right? <laughs> it's pretty big, second edition, right? Um, it's awesome. It's a really good resource, and it's all online. You don't have to carry around the big book, right? But um, uh, it's a really, really good resource. Okay, so on page ugh, 955, <laughs> there's like an amazingly good chapter on grasping. Okay, and it has pictures like this, um, what I'm showing on the screen here. That's like figure two, I guess, from that chapter. And there's just like this huge wealth of literature on grasp analysis and grasp optimization. And it was it dominated manipulation for many years. And we're spending like relatively little time on it in this class. It's, I almost feel like it's sacrilegious, okay? Sorry. Um, but, um, but here's the thing, right? So this was done in a different time. I mean, with a different set of objectives where um, 
The assumptions were that you knew a lot about the object, you potentially knew a lot about your hand, and you had to optimize against like torque limits in your fingers, things like this. And there's a lot of good things to know in there. Um, we're gonna use some of them over and over again. For instance, if you wanted to evaluate the largest possible wrench, if someone were to come up and pull something out of your object, what's the largest possible wrench that someone could pull on the object such that you stay inside your torque limits and therefore inside your friction limits and you can sort of say you'll resist a wrench. These are the kind of optimizations that you'll find in this book and they're really good, okay? But they assume a lot about your hand, knowing a lot about your hand, which was probably okay, but well, even that, I mean, I think we don't really have torque sources in our fingers most of the time. We have little itty bitty actuators on cables that are kind of not perfectly modeled. But it also just assumes a lot about the geometry of the object, the mass properties of the object, the friction properties of the object, okay? So there's been, I think along with this, the deep learning revolution and the geometric um, you know, depth camera revolution, there's been a change in the basic formulations. So, so we don't think quite as, we use a lot of the tools from this, but, um, but I think we're gonna try to do it in a slightly more messy situation, okay? So there was this sort of wave of new results that came in a handful of years ago. For, you know, these are 2016, 2017, 2018 kind of um, dates, okay? And they, uh, they just, I think, did a really nice job of sort of turning the problem statement on its head, okay? All three of those were powered by deep learning, but I think more important than the way they solved it first, it was just changing the problem specification, where it really was more like this clutter clearing, right? This is the, um, the first one that I spent time understanding uh, by Rob Platt. Um, they, all, they were all sort of came out in similar times, but I, um, you know, where they, this was a very big surprising thing, or not, I mean, it, it, was, it was not the way people typically formulated grasp problems, where you really just dumped random objects, you don't know what they are. I mean, we've, we've been saying this for clutter clearing, but this was a new thing then, okay? And it was very interesting to ask, how do you take some of this stuff from the handbook, you know, and apply it to a problem like that? And the basic um, story in most of these papers is that you learn from a, a map from the depth cloud about where to grasp. Or typically you will learn a grasp evaluator, basically, where you say, if I were to grab here, what score do I expect to get? Okay. But this was cool. This was like the first time we saw robots sort of manipulating random objects like ropes. There's a couple, I mean, there's a couple of objects here that were intentionally, be, you know, like, ah, you've never seen a robot really manipulate a rope before, right, or a cord before. And I, so when we started thinking more about this and, and watched this revolution, I think um, deep learning gave us the um, sort of the bold, you know, the ability to, to sort of push beyond what we had originally done. It was sort of like confidence, I guess. It was, deep learning gave us the confidence, but I don't think it actually, I think people underestimate how well the geometric tools still work on those problems. So as we're gonna transition from, this is our like lecture from transitioning from the geometric methods to the deep methods, let's spend a little bit more time with point clouds and geometry to do this task. And the reason I wanna do that is, okay, this is another one. This was from the, um, a local, uh, well, uh, I guess Andy Zhang was the first author on, the, on all the, um, the visual parts, of the perception parts, but this was an effort along with uh, Alberto's lab here at MIT and Cubed. Did I pick oh, a really boring part of the video to start it? Yeah, I guess. But, um, okay, they're talking through this idea that you take RGB images, you learn basically good places to suck. Okay, this is a suction, sorry. Um, right. Uh, okay, but um, Lucas uh, was in lab at the time and he spent um, time thinking about what, you know, do we actually need deep learning for this kind of things? This was when we weren't sure how well deep learning was really working. Uh, and so uh, he implemented this system which was based on not, no deep learning, uh, just geometry alone. And the basic strategy we're, we're gonna cover here is about looking for antipodal grasps, which I will tell you about. 
okay? And basically just looking for good place to grasp based on the geometry of the, of the scene. And this does pretty darn well. Like it, would, it, it achieved rates pretty similar. There's limitations. There's things that the deep learning approaches can do that this cannot do, and we'll talk about those. But this is the basic setup. Let's do this geometry-based first. Good. So that was my little um, old and new background on grasp analysis. Okay. So let's start our basic strategy for grasp selection. Okay. Um, the basic strategy is going to be very simple. I'm going to reach down to obtain a point cloud. We have to clean it up a bit. We're going to have multiple cameras looking at the scene so that we can see from all sides of the object, hopefully, roughly. We're going to have to merge the point clouds, crop the point clouds, estimate different quantities on the point clouds, OK? Um, <clears throat> then we're going to look for antipodal grasps, OK? What's an antipodal grasp, OK? So if I have some interestingly shaped object, OK, anywhere along the object, I have my colored chalk here somewhere. Oh, I left them here last time. OK, at any point on the surface of the object, I can define sort of the normal to the surface and the tangent to the surface, right? Okay, and I can evaluate this in lots of places. Okay. And what I want to do is find places where I can put my hand around it. That might be too big, depending on how big your hand is. Okay. I'd like to find places to put my enormous hand. I was a little bigger than I had in my head before I started this, but okay. Enormous hand coming in, okay. I'd like to find places where the hand is going to um, look at, you know, touch the object at two places where the normals are pointing in opposite directions. They're antipodal. They're pointing in the opposite directions. Okay. Now that might be not as true if I were to pick here and here, right? If I picked here, I squeeze too hard, it'll shoot out potentially out the side or whatever. Okay, this idea of picking antipodal grasps is going to be central to our thinking. Okay. And um, and importantly, we can uh, we can start estimating antipodalness um, based just right from the point cloud without knowing exactly the object. Okay. And then we're going to avoid collisions, try to respect joint limits. Etc. Okay? This is going to be our strongest heuristic. We're going to look down in the pile, try to find a place where we can stick our hand around, get a good antipodal grasp, and pick. Yeah. Yes, sorry, good. So um, I, you'll see when we get there. So I, we want them to be both antipodal and collinear, yes? Because I'm going to, that's going to be embedded in our sampling strategy, you'll see. But yeah, we're going to actually, when we find a normal, we're going to just penetrate through directly and ask what the, the normal is on the other side. So it becomes for yes. But we'd like the places where, um, so if I had, let's see. This and this, for instance, could be almost antipodal, but they're not in the same line, so it's no good to me as a grasp, right? They need to be antipodal and along the same line. Yes? So, would you imagine if they were like a polyhedral disk and it was smooth, not obvious to me that it would always find like a curved up line object, especially when you know that like half the objects are 
So the question is in 3D, so, so in 3D, can you always find an antipodal grasp on an object? I don't know that there's any guarantee that you can always find an antipodal grasp, right? I think you'd like to find the most antipodal grasp. That's, that's the heuristic we're gonna use. Um, whether you can find something that's perfectly antipodal, I don't think there's any guarantee. Even in 2D, why, uh, is it, it's not clear that you always find one, a collinear antipodal grasp in 2D, right? but it might not be collinear. I'm, uh, like a star, or I'm trying to think of, there's, there's probably adversarial shapes or something like this, right? Um, but yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there is any guarantee that a, that a perfectly antipodal collinear grasp exists. We're going to use that. We're going to prefer grasps that are more antipodal. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. So, um, right. So, if my hand was not enormous, right? If I had a little hand coming in here, this would be no good to me, right? So, so we're going to bring that in through asking for to try to find these kind of possible grasps and find one that if I were to put my hand there, it's not gonna be in collision with the object already. So that when I squeeze, you know, I'll, I'll be outside the object. Um, do you have to continuously solve for the optimal point? Because at what point once you start to come into contact with the object, the object might itself start changing shape as it's all like the Awesome. Object. Okay, so the question is, are, you know, are we sort of updating our antipodal estimations on the fly? Okay. Um, you know, because like squishy objects, they might change their, their normals as you, as you grab them. So here's the dirty sort of secret, okay, of, of manipulation, right, is that um, all the grasp analysis, like this entire book, well not, just, just the manipulation chapters of the, of the handbook, right, they analyze the system when it's already making contact, okay? The, the dynamics of going from out of contact to in contact we, we pretty much just kind of go like this and hope for the best, right? Um, people do use simulation to try to, and, and, you know, so one way to, one grasp metric that people like is actually in, to train a deep learning system, for instance. You might pick up a simulate, uh, you know, pick up a thing at a certain point cloud or at a certain, um, you know, point on the point cloud and then lift it up and shake it, you know, and then just see if it stayed in your hand. That's like a way to sort of test, you know, and if that, if that gives you some score and then you, you, you train whether that worked or not. But in general, the grasp analysis has always had a, has always been about statics and not about dynamics because the coming into contact dynamics is very complicated. We know how to simulate it. We don't know as much how to optimize through it. Yeah. So this is, um, so the question would be like, if I had an hourglass, for instance, um, right? If I found those, that might not be very good grasp candidate, right? I, I, think, I think that was sort of your implication maybe. Was the question was, are, are we looking only for the concave antipodal grasps? Uh, let's go through that, okay? so so. We're gonna to try to define the normals. I mean, so you could say that the, the normals could be pointing in or pointing out. We're gonna always try to have them pointing out, okay? And, um, and the curvature does tell us something, right? And we are gonna be able to estimate the curvature very easily um, or from the point clouds directly, right? Um, but I haven't included it. The, the heuristics, were, the, the examples I've given you in the notes are a fairly simple grasp strategy, but they don't involve any notion of the curvature in the score. Um, this kind of a grasp would be ruled out more by the collision again. Yeah. So, you know, these two together get you pretty far. These are great. I love the questions. So please keep chiming in. Okay. So um, let's see. Back before um, deep learning, if you were doing like image processing, there was sort of a library of things that you would learn how to do with images. You could like find edges in images. You could like expand blobs to try to find regions of similar color. There's sort of a library of, of image processing techniques 
Um, they still exist. They didn't disappear, but they're not as necessary now because we just pattern match everything. Um, there's a similar library of things you can do with point clouds, okay? Um, there's no books on them, unfortunately, but there's like documentation for the software. You know, uh, the PCL library is, documentation is extremely good. And um, yeah, I, I feel sort of sad that there's not like a point cloud processing book that I know of. Um, but I, I pointed to the few references that I know, okay? Um, but there's lots of good things you can do with point clouds, and we're gonna do, I'll tell you, step you through a few of them, okay? So, some of them are, are natural, but they're gonna be very important here, okay? So, um, in general, let me, let me just even set this up, okay? So, this notebook here, I've got a hairy mustard bottle. Um, let me make it less hairy for a second here. Okay, good. So um, I've set this up where I have the initial point clouds. I have three cameras. This is the same situation I gave you before. Three cameras around the mustard bottle. Okay, so um, those cameras see, they're gonna see the mustard bottle, they're gonna see the bin. If I put it in the bin, they see the other cameras, right? I get returns from the first camera looking this way that gets off all of these different um, objects. There's another camera over here that sees that side of the object, and there's another clamp camera. See, that's point cloud one and point cloud two, right? So, all together, I've got three pretty good views of the objects, okay? But I need to do some basic processing, get rid of the, the, these junk outside, okay? Um, I'll crop them, merge them, estimate normals on them, downsample them, okay? Sort of reasonable operations. I think the most interesting one is the normal estimation because you get lo local curvature information from that too. Um, but there's a basic library of these things. So cropping a point cloud is pretty reasonable. If I've got a bunch of X, Y, Z points, I tend to put a bounding box. If you think I'm gonna reach into a bin or I'm looking at the top of the table, then just making a bounding box in the frame to get the points of interest, to rule out the cameras, you know, very simple operation. An essential. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let me just, I'll write them down and we'll go through the normal estimation a little bit more carefully, but we can estimate the normals, okay? Which is what I showed with the vectors here that looks like a crazy pincushion thing. Okay, that's a normal estimation. All these, at every surface point here, there's a vector coming off showing the local normals of the point cloud, okay? Say a bit about that, okay. We can, take those three separate point clouds and merge them into a single point cloud, some, um, some fusion operation, and we can downsample. Now, before we dig into each of them, let me just say that I've chosen to do them in this order um, for a reason. I think the order mat does matter, okay? So cropping is just get rid of the extra points you know you don't need right away. But the normal estimation should come before downsampling, for instance, because you're gonna try to use as many points as possible to try to estimate those normals. You get the, the densest point cloud you can deal with, you know, will give you more accurate normals, okay? But the normal estimation also is gonna come before the merge, merging the point clouds. Um, anybody know why I wanna do the normal estimation before? So she says, um, so you can merge um, normals, sim similar normals better together. That's pretty much what I, what I want to say. There's, there's a, a twist on it that matters, I guess. I mean, we talked about it before too when we said you lose some information when you go from the depth image to the point cloud, right? As soon as I've merged the point clouds together into one big cloud, then I've kind of implicitly forgotten where my cameras were, or I don't know which ones 
which corresponded to which camera. Okay, so in this, in this question that Alex was asking here, so I'm getting some returns here. I have um, a question of, you know, which of these is my normal? Is it the one pointing in? Is it pointing out? How do you robustly find the point cloud, the normal pointing out? Okay. If my camera is coming this way, there's a, in all these point cloud libraries, there's a flip normals towards camera, where you basically say, here's my camera position, here's my list of normals, flip them so they're all pointing towards the camera. Okay, so if I, I can do that on the unmerged point clouds and get my normals pointing in the right direction. Okay, then I'll merge them together, which in general um, can be a, a fusion operator like the point cloud, uh, the, the iter iterative closest point type of algorithm, and then we'll use voxels for downsampling. Okay, let me, th let me tell you a little bit about normal estimation. So how do we get those porcupine normals out of a dense point cloud? In broad strokes, we're gonna find the K nearest neighbor, right? For every point, let me say, for every pixel, every point, find the K nearest neighbors. You can put a max distance so you don't find, if, if you don't have K local nearest neighbors, you don't end up including somebody um, too far away. We're going to fit a plane similar to what you did in the ransack problem um, to the local point cloud. Okay, and then flip the normals. We're going to be able to get out, in the way we fit the plane, um, we're going to be able to get out the curvature too. It's pretty, pretty elegant. But finding the k nearest neighbors, let me even show you what that looks like here. I've got a, hopefully my thing is still alive here. For those of you watching the slides.com, I'm sorry, I'm going to flip to you might want to flip to just the video stream for a second here. I spent a ridiculous, you guys wouldn't know what I go through with some of these, but um, let's see. I almost have deep note working for everything. By like tonight, I, I think I'll have everything ported to deep note. Open3D, which I was using for some of the point cloud processing, doesn't work. The versions that we use doesn't work on Mac 3. Point, you know, Python greater than 3.7. So, but everything else is using Python 3.9 on, on Mac. And you know, this on, on, on. Anyways, I'm running it from Colab today. Um, and, but, but tonight, everything will be good again. Nice. I can get a new tunnel without. Encouraging.
you only get two tunnels. So, so if this one doesn't work, I'm dead. But uh, I'll have to restart Colab. Uh, two free tunnels, and then you have to pay for NGROC. And I can't pay for NGROC on Colab. I, I don't mind paying. I just don't know how to do it on the cloud, um, <clears throat> where my IP address is different every time. OK, so this is roughly uh, um, what I want you to see here. Um, my normal estimation, it's very hard to see in this. Let's see if I can make that bigger. And I tried to make it brighter, but the old mesh cat won't let me. You can kind of see this, what's going on there. There's a blue line there, a red line there. Yeah, that's my, my tri triad sitting there, okay. So I pick a sample point, and I've got a little GUI for you here where you can just literally just change which pixel am I centered down. And there's a lot of pixels, 10,000 some, you know, 15,000 pixels in the mustard bottle point cloud. Okay, and for each pixel, I'll just use that as and find the K nearest neighbor. That's going to give me the blue region. I'll only pick one that's not inside another blue region on the French's label. Okay. And there you go. So I'm going to pick a handful of nearest neighbors. I'm going to fit a plane to that. Take the z-axis to be the, um, we're going to see the math for, for how to do that, to find the z-axis. And actually, we're going to draw the other two axes of the, uh, um, of the, the frame along the dimensions of relatively maximum and secondary curvature, okay? Now what's amazing to me about this, and I, I remember when we were first started doing a lot more of this, I was like, okay, surely you're not gonna go through every single point of a dense point cloud, take every K nearest neighbor, fit a plane, you know, and then go to the next point, like for 15,000 points, like in a real time perception algorithm. And, and you know, my students who were doing that at the time were like, no, it's fine. Uh, and I was just wrong. I mean, I think that people do that, and people do it all the time. And that was like a few years ago, and now it, you know, computers are even faster, more, more parallel. Yeah? It, it seems expensive, I agree. But it's in this, you know, computers are fast. <laughs> so uh, people do this all the time. Like, it's a standard processing step, pre-processing step, where you go through your even dense point cloud. In fact, dense is recommended because, um, I mean, you could, you could choose to evaluate it as a subset of the points, but you'd like to find dense nearest neighbors to get a more accurate representation of the local curvature. Yeah, so I've done it for the entire thing and drawn most of the normals. Okay, so, th and in general, I would say that is a theme, that people do pretty significant processing on the point clouds and it's faster than you'd think, or that I would think. The, it is true, so the, the point was about the k-nearest neighbor. So the k-nearest neighbor uses typically FLAN, which is a, a, a fast, uh, probably fast lookup, I don't know, approximate nearest neighbor. But it's a, it's, a, it's a common library that people use in robotics for fast nearest neighbor lookups. Um, and yes, I think having very good data structures for very fast approximate nearest neighbor queries is essential to making this work, no question. Okay, um, so how do you fit a plane to a local point cloud? If you've got a bunch of points, now what I want you to see, uh, um, at least at broad strokes, is that this looks like the optimizations we were already doing, and there's some geometry about that problem that I think will help you understand how you can get the curvature out too. So let me just step through that one. Okay, if I've got a bunch of points, I'd like to fit a local normal. And I'll do that by sort of fitting a local plane to my points, okay? The normal I'm gonna write here, I'm gonna ask the normal to have um, magnitude one. And I'm gonna define the plane in terms of the normal and the point 
at which the point P, let me draw here, the normal plus the point can define that local plane. Okay? So what I want to do is now search for N and P in order to maximize the fit of these, of these points. Okay? So the distance from any one point, from any sample point to the plane, I can write with a dot product. Okay? So I'll take a dot product between The vector here, right, I've got some vector, this is pi, this is my p, so I'll write pi minus p here, and the distance to the, from the point to the plane is the, the dot product of, of this vector with this vector, right, so it's, that's, I drew that small, but is that clear? I could make it bigger if it's helpful, but. That product gives me this distance, which is the distance from the point to the plane. Yeah. So I'll take this vector and I'll dot product with n. Okay, so that gives me a scalar number. I want to um, minimize the the magnitude of this number. So if I would. If I were to just take this uh, you know, and, and say minimize that, it would drive me to very big negative numbers. So I'm going to take the squared of this and sum over all of my points. And I like to minimize over P and N subject to a constraint that N equals 1. This looks scary. It turns out that it has a nice solution. Okay. The reason it has a nice solution is that you can actually solve for p as a function, of the, the optimal p as a function of n, just like we did in the other point cloud processing algorithms. It's not surprising that the, the strategy will be pretty similar. Bless you. I went, through it, I went through it in the notes before, but not in, on the board before. I don't know if people want or don't want this. I'll subject it to you this time, and you can tell me after. Um, so the way you try to, to, to optimize a constrained optimization is you write the Lagrangian. So you bring the constraint in to the optimization. So I can write the Lagrangian, which is my original cost function. If this is foreign to you, you know, try to appreciate it at, at, a, at a higher level and we can, you can, it's written up in the notes, okay? So this is my original objective. I'm gonna write plus a Lagrange multiplier times my constraint, okay? Which you can write a handful of different ways, but I'll write it like that. It's called the Lagrangian of the constrained optimization. The amazing thing about Lagrange multipliers is that if I take the gradient of this Lagrangian, so this is called a Lagrange multiplier, that one I think you've seen in various capacities, <clears throat> okay? But it turns out that the optimal solution of the constrained problem is gonna be a stationary, it's gonna be a stationary point of this problem means the gradients of this with respect to the parameters and with respect to the Lagrange multipliers are going to have to be zero. So that was a long way to say if I were to take the gradient of this with respect to P at an optimal, it's going to be zero. 
So I can write the gradient of that with respect to P. Let me expand. Um, it's a little bit, you got to get your head around that, this thing being squared, okay? But I'll write it out completely and transpose pi minus p, okay? And these terms don't depend on p. So partial L partial P gives you, it gets to looking like this, minus two N and transpose, I'm gonna write the transpose of it just to keep it looking a little bit more friendly. It looks like this. This is just a quadratic form. It looks a little scary, but it, it just looks like that. Okay. This has special structure um, because n is is, uh, is unit magnitude, but mostly it, the, the thing that it implies for me is that if I want this to be equal to zero, then this then I can then the sum of these has to be equal to zero. Sort of a simple um, version of it. And p star equals one over n sum over i pi. Okay, there's a few steps there, but it gives you roughly what you'd expect from the original, you know, the same thing we saw in the point cloud or in the um, point registration problem where the optimal p is like your average p. That's kind of not, I think geometrically that's not surprising and it comes through an optimization, and uh, the steps are also in the notes, I hope, so you don't have to write everything down if you're worried about it. <clears throat> okay, if I substitute this back in, then um, I can write the entire optimization, I can solve away P, I can write the entire optimization now in terms of N, and it just looks like this. where W is our data matrix, just like we did before. Okay, I actually don't care as much, I don't care as much about the, the algebra steps. I want you to understand the intuition here. Is that, the, that this optimization is now a quadratic form in N. So if I were to plot the 2D version of it, I had N1 and N2. W is this symmetric quadratic form. It's gonna be a convex objective, so I'm gonna have like the level sets of W, of X transpose W is looking like this, right? So this is N transpose WN equals, I don't know, three. And this is equals two, right? So this is my quadratic bowl I had before. Okay, and it goes through the origin, despite my artwork not being great. I also have the unit circle constraint, right? This is the n equals one. So now, what's the optimal solution? Where is the optimum for this problem? If I'm trying to minimize this objective where I've drawn the level sets, it's zero if n was zero going up it has to live on this equality constraint. Yeah. This tangent or this tangent? The second one, right? Right, so that is an optimal point, right? That's 
the, in the, inside the lower level set, the lowest level set that touches the constraint. Okay? It's also at this one, again, artwork, not, that should be touching there too if I was a better artist, right? So there's two equally good normals. They're just the opposite of each other, a, flip, a, a sign flip away from each other. And that's exactly what we're, you know, that's the into the, into the object and out of the object would fit the plane just as well. Okay. So this corresponds with one of the eigenvalues of the optimization and this other direction here actually is the second. Um, this is the, you know, the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue, right? Eigenvector two corresponding to eigenvalue two, okay? So which one's the bigger eigenvalue? Is the bigger eigenvalue. This one? This one. Right, this should be the smallest eigenvalue unless I'm twisting, right? right? For a unit length here, I get a smaller number there. The cool thing is that I have these other directions here. This is actually the steepest descent, right? So this is the place where um, the cost function is largest, this vector along here. And if I did it in 3D, I have two other eigenvectors that are corresponding to two other eigenvalues, okay? The larger eigenvalues correspond to a larger value here, which corresponds with a larger dot product with the points, okay? So let me see. So if I had a points that were along some local curvature, okay, and I'm trying to fit a plane to it, then there's a vector which fits this, that goes through this point, which fits these points with the highest possible dot product, right? The largest eigenvalue should go with the, the place of lowest curvature. The smallest eigenvalue is gonna be my normal. And the middle eigenvalue is gonna be my other normal, because the, um, the, the, matri the eigenvectors are going to make an orthonormal matrix. Um, the third eigenvector is going to give me uh, my, my last row of middle curvature. Okay? So it actually parameterizes the surface in terms of it ordered by the directions of curvature. Okay, so some of the grasp heuris heuristics, you know, uh, this is gets to Alex's question earlier, um, do use local curvature. They might find a place that has a good antipodal grasp, but is also curved in, right? That, that's an easy thing to now include in your grasp heuristic, okay? Now, I, I did do this real-time sort of um, estimate. Uh, I realized when I typed it in, so every once in a while you'll find a point that doesn't obey the right-hand rule, right? You could still get an improper rotation if you just take the eigenvectors. So that's my bad, I'll fix that too. So, so um, but, this would, if you just took the eigenvectors out of your random eigenvector algorithm, there's no reason that they would be ordered in a way that would obey the right-hand rule. So you have to sort of check for improper rotations and flip them and other things, and, and uh, that will be happening in this notebook shortly. I apologize, I forgot to do it. The things you notice right before lecture, <laughs> right? Okay, so that's pretty cool, right? Local point processing, little optimization, solved in closed form by, well, just by taking eigenvectors and eigenvalues, gives me normals, gives me local curvature, fast enough to run on a whole dense point cloud, okay? It's part of your library, part of your toolkit.
Okay, once we do that, merging the point clouds, the next step is merging point clouds. So if you have two, think about the way that these point clouds look, these partial point clouds, right? So I'm gonna um, flip back to this one. Okay, I've got two point clouds here, point cloud one, point cloud two. How do I find their alignment, right? How do I merge them into a single point cloud? If I know my relative camera positions perfectly, and I think the points are clean enough, then you really can just add them together, okay? But in reality, and so in simulation, that's actually what I did. In reality, you don't do that, typically, unless you've got really good camera calibration and you like have rules so that nobody leans on the cameras. And um, you can always tell a, a theorist when they come near a robot because they'll like lean on your cameras. You'd be like, oh, I just spent an hour calibrating that, right? So um, I like theorists, but I just don't like them when they bump my cameras. Um, okay, so in general, we already have the tools for, uh, you know, for, for estimating these, uh, to, to, to find these things into alignment, right? So if I have, point clouds that overlap in some capacity, I can just run a point registration algorithm, right? ICP is sort of the right tool for taking these almost aligned point clouds and snapping them into place, right? Or ICP and its variants. Okay, so the full version of merging point clouds is really just running a point registration algorithm. We talked about it before as having an object-specific point cloud. You can do it on the dense point cloud that has lots of objects, there's no reason, you're just doing it's also called scan matching, right? You just bring two scans into alignment, okay? Good, and then downsampling is the last um, big step. And this is really just a simple algorithm, and the question is really what's the right data structures to, that it enabled this to be fast, okay? And the right data structures are, tend to be voxel grids. So you're gonna tile your space. With a bunch of cubes, unit cu you know, cubes of a certain fixed size typically, okay? And just fill your, fill your space with the whole grid of these cubes. We'll use good data structures so that we only represent the cubes we're actually using. We don't actually Enumerate all of the cubes. Yeah. When you're doing the point cloud merging with the dense cubes, does it matter which timeline point cloud you use? Like that target point cloud to merge? Good question. So, the, so in the ICP, we, we sp specified the model versus the scene points. Now I've just got two scene points, roughly. Does it matter which one you uh, you you calibrate to? I mean, the math should be symmetric, right? So you should be able to either. Translate, translate camera two into camera one's frame, camera one into camera two's frame, right? So uh, up to the heuristics, when you start doing, you know, nearest neighbor, there's places where you break that symmetry in the optimization with some of the tricks we used, but the basic operation is roughly symmetric. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so Voxelization is sort of the standard strategy for, um, for downsampling your point cloud, right? If I wanna now run it into a more expensive um, grasp selection algorithm, I probably don't wanna carry around 15,000 points in my point cloud, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick my sort of a representative thousand of them, let's say, or 100 of them, okay? The way that people do that is they will break the space up into little cubes, voxels, okay? take all of the points that land inside the voxel and summarize them with a single point. The cheap way to do it is you put a point at the, if there's, if there's any points inside the, the voxel, you just use the middle of the voxel as your, as your point in the point cloud. If your voxels are small enough, that's fine. A slightly more expensive one that they did in PCL, I don't think they do it in Open3D, um, 
is that you'll just take, of all the points inside that little voxel, you take the centroid. Just a little bit marginally more expensive, but it gives you slightly better, uh, better downsampled points out. But roughly, you know, collapse all of the points in some small volume into one point. That's a natural way to sort of downsample, okay? This is a version with the voxels being pretty darn big and kept the color code from there. But you can make your voxels pretty small and they use sparse data structures and you can get arbitrarily good reproductions of your original, you know, as the resolution gets down. Okay. There's no guarantees of, of um, watertight. So the question was, are there going to be any holes, right? Um, most of these things are, are, do not guarantee watertightness or anything like that. You will often, like for instance, the bottom of the mustard bottle is always going to be empty, right? So it's always going to look hollow in that sense. Yeah. Uh, do you average the normals? Um, yes, so good. So, so uh, typically you'll average the normals too. So if you have to take all those points and you just take an average of the normals. Even the people that just keep the centroid will, nor will average the normals. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make sense to do anything else. Cool. Um, let me flip back to this. Okay, so this putting this um, together, we've got our local um, estimating normal, normals and local curvature. Now, how are we going to use all that information to score a GRASP candidate? Okay, I made a little GUI, but let me tell you my rough, my, uh, my course approximation sort of simplified version of the heuristics people use which is going to take my hand, okay? It's got my mustard bottle here. Okay. I'm going to first crop the point cloud. I'm going to move the point cloud into the hand frame. You can apply those rigid transforms uh, on the dense point clouds. It's sufficient enough, okay? And then I'm going to crop all the points that are, that are not between the fingers. Okay, so I'm just going to take, I want to only consider points sort of in that region. So I'll just crop my point cloud down to just being that region, okay? And then each of those points has a normal associated with it. I'm gonna score the grasp as being good if the, by summing up the component of the normal that is aligned with my hand aligned with the x-axis of my, or this, I forget which axis it is, but. Basically taking a dot product with the line here and trying to reward points that contribute a normal close to the specter. The more points you get, the more reward you get. And for each point, you get more reward if you're aligned with the, with the normal. That's not a super special magic, this is the best thing to do. This is just one of the heuristics people use out there uh, for antipodal grasping, right? You can invent your own. You'll find cases where this one does something you don't like and you might tweak it. I don't have a, a magically better um, optimal solution for you. Okay, but I do have a cool GUI for you. Which I hope runs here. Okay, here's my cameras and my bins, my hand with magic glowing point clouds that are um, the ones that survived my cropping. Let me see if I can orient this a little better. You see what's happening there? Yeah. And I have sliders so you can move the hand around and evaluate your score. Okay, so this is a cost negative 39.97. That's pretty good. Um, 
right? And I just, I, I, you know, I don't want to play with this in front of you. I want you to play with it. Um, it's in the notebook, right? So what happened there is I went down a little too far, and the top of the mustard bottle is intersecting with the, the geometry of the hand. So I got an infinite cost. Gripper is colliding with the point cloud, okay? But you can lift up, check out your costs, check out your normals. You can roll the hand around, okay? And a sort of putting those point cloud, basic point cloud operations together uh, gives you something that you can evaluate quickly at runtime and give you a, uh, some geometric heuristic for how good that grasp is going to be, right? So why is that antipodal a good heuristic, right? I think, oh, please. Good, so, so my setup so far here is, um, we talked about point cloud processing, and then this is scoring grasp candidates. So, so this is, I'm telling you where the hand is, you give me a number. The next step is gonna be, how do you find a good one? And that's where you start making those choices. Okay, so it's not surprising that the antipodal would be good from, um, you know, from just trying to make good contact, okay? But why do you wanna make good contact? I think, I think there is an important lesson that you, should have from the sort of handbook of robotics, right? So if I'm making contact at these points, as I'm about to squeeze, right? Then the contact I have is gonna produce some amount of friction and it's gonna give me a friction cone. Each of these places, it'll be attached to that normal. I'm, I had to pick to draw next to the finger, or the, but, but when it collides, that friction cone will be at the side of the bottle, okay? The other thing I have is I have a gravity vector, or maybe adversarially I have somebody pulling on the bottle and try to get it out of my hands, but let's just say we have a gravity vector, okay? Now to get static equilibrium, as you know from, as you're doing your problem set, okay? These, you have to find a vector inside these friction cones such that it's, everything's in equilibrium. So those two forces have to equal and opposite balance in order to have equilibrium, right? The horizontal components and the vertical components has to be enough to, to cancel out gravity, right? So you need that friction cone to be big enough and you know, tilt it away from gravity so you can imagine other heuristics too. In fact. I do put a heuristic saying your hand shouldn't be too tilted because you'd like to have your normals sort of oriented horizontally there, okay? But that's the picture, right? These forces have to fight this gravity that's trying to pull it out of your hand, right? Okay? So the bigger the friction cone, the better off you are. Having antipodal grasps, potentially with curvature, gives you more, it's kind of a subtle argument, it gives you more friction because you're gonna have more surface contact in the object. Okay, so you imagine that actually changing your friction cone. Okay, and that will resist a bigger wrench. That's the, that's the thought process. Yes? Sorry, are you allowed to know what the friction cone is? You don't. Good question, so how, how do you know what the friction cone is? You say 0.8. Uh, you, roughly, no, no, it's, that's just being silly. But um, we really, I think it is not something that you know with high accuracy. For, for, I, and I think that is, a, that is a place where some of the, you know, original works that were very model-based, you would say, I have a detailed model of my hand, and, my, and that's very fragile, okay? So it's safe to underestimate your friction cone, okay? Um, but, you know, picking a number and going with it is sort of the strategy. The antipodal grasps don't actually use the coefficient of friction anywhere. They just say, of, you, between two things that are equal, pick the one that is likely to have a bigger friction, um, you know, better surface contact and therefore a better friction cone. So it doesn't have any explicit dependence on the number that is your friction. It's a good question, right? So I think assuming you know the friction is, is, a, is a bad assumption, typically. Okay, so now the question is, I have a scoring function, I have an objective, how do I pick out, pick where my hand should be, right? 
We said non-penetration constraints are difficult optimization constraints. We could use SNAP to get stuck sometimes. Um, this one is a very hard optimization with all these point clouds in the middle and everything like that. So we don't hand this one to SNAP. We just sample a bunch of candidates and we take the best. It's partly because the SNAP, SNAP formulation would be very hard uh, in terms of yeah, the, the solver would get stuck. It has lots of, lots of local minima. It's also because we have pretty good heuristics for where to sample, right? We can kind of use our geometry intuition to, to pick reasonable sampling um, heuristics. So the one that I use in the, in the notebook there is gonna be, I'm gonna take an arbitrary point, take its normal, align the hand, I'm gonna sample a grasp. It could be a, a grasp at any or orientation, which puts the fingers normal in alignment with the normal coming off the, the bottle, okay? And just backed off by some amount. Then I'm gonna shoot through. This is the, um, the question about collinear. I'm actually gonna do a ray cast operation, effectively. Find the normal that's directly on the other side of it, okay? And you know, ask, can I basically, actually that's not true. Um, what I ended up doing in the notes because Open3D didn't have Raycast was I just put the hand here, I just picked this, this number arbitrarily, put the hand here and then did that ev evaluation of, of cropping the point cloud and asking how good my score is and am I, and I am, am I in collision? Okay, so for every, I'm gonna just pick a point at random in my point cloud pick a grasp where my, my thumb is like a little bit away from that, but aligned with that particular normal, and just pick a, a bunch of grasps like that, right? Rotating just around that, and that one axis around that normal, okay? And I'll just go through and pick a bunch of them. And I'll take the best five or something like this. How many did I keep? I drew a handful of them. That was a bad. Okay, each time, I, I don't know why it was disconnecting, but I threw a bunch of random bins in the, um, lots of objects in the bin. I ran my little sampling strategy like this, kept the best handful, and you get typically a pretty diverse set of interesting grasps. Yeah, see? And then you just pick the best one, for instance. I, I drew the best you know, end, but typically you'll pick the best one. Yes. So when It's a good question. So the question is, um, you know, is there any utility? I said the optimization problem is hard. Why not do at least a local optimization after you've sampled? Um, I think the question is just how how to shove that data. You know, what what data to shove into the optimizer? I think it'd be great to try. Yeah, um, people I think typically don't but I, I would like it, yeah. Um, okay, so this, is a, this gets you pretty far, right? So um, roughly reach down, find the antipodal grasps, avoid collisions, you know, reject anything that has a collision, keep the best one, grab, pick it up and drop it off at the other side. That gets pretty far in clutter clearing, okay? What can't it do? I hope you'll play around with those notebooks. Um, you know, there are limits, I think, really, you know, sort of fundamental limits to the geometric only version of it. Uh, it really doesn't have any sense of what an object is. Let me rewind that here. So one of the things it does, for instance, is it will uh, do these double picks. Sorry that the angle's not good there, but there were two boxes with the, with the sides, like uh, happened to be lined up, right? There's absolutely no way that it can understand that those are two objects. Just geometrically, it just doesn't have that concept, right? So you could train a system that would understand that those things should be separate objects and should not be picked together, but the geometry doesn't tell you it. There's something more you have, some more information you have, right? Another common case would be like you pick up a hammer. I think this is Rachel's research, right? <laughs> so you, you, you pick up a hammer, right, and, and or an eraser here, and by my grasp candidate, this is just as good of a place to pick up as this, 
right? There's no concept of object anywhere in the scene, so the, the notion that the center of mass would be a good place to pick it up doesn't exist anywhere at this metric. I have a, just as good of a chance of picking it up here, and then I've got a big torque that's trying to wrench it out of my hand, right? And that's just missing from this formulation, okay? Partial views. So I do think that there's some opportunity for a deep learning sort of approach to learn having picked things up, um, basically what the backside of an object looks like. If I had a point cloud that was only coming from this side, the geometry alone, the instantaneous geometry alone, doesn't tell me anything about the backside, and it would limit my ability to, to try to take a grasp on something I can't see. There's nothing I said here about hallucinating normals in places where you, you don't have them. But if I trained and picked things up and dropped it, you could potentially learn something that sort of hallucinated the backside of objects. People do they explicitly, there's a whole field of sort of shape completion um, that you could do with a neural network, but this is doing it sort of implicitly. If you just say, find good places to grasp on these point clouds, you might be able to find something that sort of does a little bit of shape completion for you, right? Um, you know, another reason, another limitation of this would be the fact that um, we talked about our limitations of just the point cloud sensors. If you're fully dependent on point clouds and you want to pick up, uh, you know, a transparent bottle, you're, you're going to be sad, right? So, you, so RGB based methods are going to work better for that. But overall, this is a pretty effective strategy, right? It really can um, move a lot of different things out of the way and, and, and feed your data, uh, feed your data pipeline. I will say that when we started implementing this and tried to make it, you know, um, useful, there are a bunch of like corner cases that you have to start dealing with. So um, big chunk hand getting into the corners of the bins was, is bad news. It just doesn't, and, or there's kinematic limitations of the arm that come, come into play, right? I didn't, I separated now good positions from the hand. I didn't actually think of the kinematic limitations of the arms. So in practice, things would have a way of like the remote control would always get in the bottom back corner. So if you watch that clutter clearing video, again, you'll see that there's, a, there's extra little things that will try to brush things out of the corner into the center, and then it'll flip back to the antipodal grasp, okay? Um, but if you layer a few of those pretty simple, very general point cloud-based operations together, then you get a pretty darn good system. Any other questions about that? Awesome. So the question is about the collision detection. So um, we have close, we have collision geometries, simple collision geometries of the gripper, maybe of the bins, okay, maybe of the cameras. So we want those to not collide. But we also want the points in the point cloud to not collide with the geometry. Now, if you were had noisy point clouds, you'd have to probably threshold that, right, and allow a little bit of, of, of collision. But in general, we're I'm actually collision checking the point cloud with the closed form geometry of the hand. So if there's any points inside my, my simple geometry collision. But that includes points of other objects. Yes, there's no notion of, so that's exactly right. So I think if you were to think about um, grasp selection one object at a time, you would get a very different answer than like what's a good grasp given you're sticking this thing in clutter, right? Because you're the, the places where you can actually grab are very highly constrained by the objects that are around it. Yeah, and those collisions are essential to take into account. So there is no objectness here, right? It's just the, the big pile of points that may be one or more objects that I should not collide with. Good. Okay, we'll see.